Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Leslie Rattan. I'm a psychologist. I practice in uh, clinical psychology and clinical neuropsychology at Toronto Rehab. And we are here tonight to bring you uh, an education session uh, entitled Prolonged Symptoms of Single and Multiple Concussions. And this is brought to you through the Canadian Concussion Centre and the University Health Network. We have been running two night uh, in-person workshops uh, quarterly since 2014, and we're scheduled to run uh, our last one in May of this year, but because of COVID, we were unable to do that. So we have adapted and are instead bringing shorter education sessions that, uh, that will be available on the Canadian Concussion Center website uh, for you to view. Uh, I'd also like to thank Layuna, uh, who has been a very generous supporter of the patient support activities at the Canadian Concussion Centre uh, over the course of this last, um, last several years. So I'm going to just uh, begin uh, by introducing uh, the speakers tonight. I'm really pleased to announce that we've got Char Dr. Charles Tatter, who's a professor of neurosurgery. Um, at the University Health Network, uh, Division of Neurosurgery at the Toronto Western Hospital, and also Director of the Canadian Concussion Centre. We also have Dr. Afame Tarasi, who's a neurologist also at the Toronto Western. And for the first half of the uh, session tonight, Dr. Tarasi and I will be going back and forth, presenting for about 30 minutes. And Dr. Tatter will uh, spend this, the second half of the, the session answering questions that have been submitted by, um, by our viewers. So just to provide you with a bit of an outline, uh, we're gonna just provide some uh, concussion education, talk about causes and diagnosis, symptoms and recovery course, as well as provide a bit of an introduction to management strategies. And then that will be followed by the question and answer session. I'll just add as well, and I'll speak more about this at, at the end, but we will be having uh, a, a second session in November that will be more focused on the management strategies. So in terms of, um, in terms of the issue at hand, in terms of concussion, uh, concussion disorders really, uh, they include the transient effects of a single concussion at the, at the mildest range uh, of the spectrum to cases where symptoms can persist for a longer period of time. We know that there are about 150,000 concussions in Ontario per year, and these occur as a result of various types of activities, people falling, sports-related incidents, motor vehicle accidents, assaults, work injuries, and so forth. What we know is that the majority of people that sustain a concussion actually make a, a good recovery. Uh, but there's a smaller percentage uh, in the range of 10 to 15, and sometimes higher than that, uh, of individuals who sustain a concussion, but may experience symptoms that go belong, uh, beyond the normal recovery period, which is generally felt to be about three months. And what we also know is that multiple concussions, so particularly if someone uh, sustains um, a concussion when they're still recovering from symptoms from a previous concussion, may be more vulnerable to having uh, prolonged post-concussive symptoms. In Ontario, uh, the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation has worked to develop standards and guidelines for the treatment of concussion and for prolonged symptoms of concussion. And they have put out guideline uh, for uh, concussion and mild traumatic brain injury and prolonged symptoms. The, the most recent version was the third edition that you see there on the screen. And this is specific to adults. They have also put out standards for post-concussion care. And their overarching vision in setting the standards, um, in their words, is to have the right care delivered at the right time by the right provider across the province. And just so that you know, these uh, guidelines and documents are all uh, available online so anyone can access. And moreover, as you'll also see on the screen, there is a patient version uh, that is directed specifically at individuals that have had uh, a concussion. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Terazzi. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Apamata Razi. Uh, 
I'm going to provide a very brief uh, basic review of the brain uh, in order to have a better understanding uh, uh, how, where and how concussion uh, exactly involve the brain. Um, our brain weighs about um, three pounds and uh, it has a consistency. Um, its consistency is soft, pliable, and slippery, and it consists of neurons and supporting cells and has a very rich blood supply. Uh, as we can see here in this slide, the brain is protected by the skull and three membranes. Uh, we can see dura matter, pi matter, and arachnoid. Um, within the skull, the brain is floating in the cerebrospinal fluid we can see here. Uh, so uh, this is important as uh, the brain can uh, jostle around in the skull during the concussion. Um, we have gray matter and white matter. A gray matter mainly consisted of uh, neurons and dendrites and supporting cells, and white matter, which is the transport system, uh, usually consists of axons, uh, and um, uh, the main part which is affected during the concussion is white matter. We can see here the neurons, this, the, these are the dendrites, as in this is the body, and this is the oxen. And we can see how complicated in this picture, how complicated it is. The brain archi architecture is constantly changing. New connections can be made, even the neurons can be created. Some uh, the pre-existing connections can be strengthened or even weakened. And these changes um, can be triggered and stimulated uh, by uh, our experiences during our life, including our activities, our um, social interactions, um, our cognitive um, function, function, so they can be changed. So during the lifespan of an individual, the brain can change us can change. And even the brain architecture is different between one person to the another person. The cognitive reserve of the brain is very important in order to compensate and to help us with the recovery after different traumas to the brain or any injuries to the brain. Um, we can have a low reserve and a high reserve. So it can be for example, as an example, we can say if this is a very this is a highway and transit system. So this is a complicated highway, and this is more simple highway or the transit system. So low re cognitive reserve is like the simple highway, and high cognitive reserve is more complicated, or the transit system, as we can see here. Cognitive reserve can can be built up over. Our, um, our lifetimes um, so that um, we can build up our cognitive reserve by learning new things, by education, by social interactions, by having a healthy lifestyle. And it's very important to increase this cognitive reserve because after a brain injury, it's important to uh, replenish this uh, buffer and it can help us with the recovery after the damage. So it's important to uh, challenge and um, to be challenged in our life and to be engaged in cognitive and physical activities in order to increase this cognitive reserve. What is a concussion? Different terms have been used in a literature to uh, explain concussion. Concussion or mild traumatic brain injury. In sports, they were <laughs> mainly the, um, the athletes suffered bell ringer, seeing stars. It's an immediate temporary alteration of mental function after the trauma and uh, doesn't need necessarily loss of consciousness. It doesn't uh, require a direct hit to the head or a direct blow. It can cause by whiplash injury. And we are not expecting to see um, any abnormality uh, after the concussion in CT or MRI. We usually uh, refer patients for CT and MRI in order to rule out a more major um, traumatic brain injury or to rule out any blood in their brain. We don't expect to see um, anything in CT or MRI after the concussion. There are different types of forces that can cause concussion, acceleration, deceleration, rotational forces. 
Acceleration and deceleration, as we can see in this picture, uh, can be caused by a direct contact or a whiplash injury. And rotational forces are a sudden rotation of the brain. And white matter are very vulnerable to this type of um, uh, forces. Uh, and the recovery phases are usually uh, recovery phases are usually more prolonged after rotational forces. And many concussions have. Uh, both mechanisms can be caused by both mechanisms, both acceleration, deceleration, and uh, rotational forces. For example, uh, in a motor vehicle accident or uh, in some sport uh, related concussions. Immediate symptoms after the concussion can be divided to physical, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral. Physical uh, symptoms like pain, seeing the stars, headaches, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, and even seizures. Uh, cognitive symptoms after the concussion um, can be fogginess, confusion, disorientation, loss of consciousness, and amnesia. Amnesia um, can be retrograde or integrate a few hours before the concussion or even some hours after the concussion. Some patients uh, cannot remember. And emotional behavioral symptoms including um, anger, um, hyper-emotionality, um, agitation, uh, aggression. So there are different emotional uh, symptoms right after the concussion. But these symptoms are not specific to concussion and not everyone with um, concussion has these symptoms. How do we know that we have a concussion? There is no specific way to diagnose a concussion. So diagnosis should uh, include uh, a, a, a thorough uh, neurological examination examination in general, physical examination, including neurological examination. History is very important and can help us with the mechanism of concussion or if the patient has conco had concussion. So history is very important. Uh, cognitive screen for, um, in order to do a better uh, assessment of the cognition, but uh, it doesn't necessarily need to have cognitive um, deficit at the time of the concussion, uh, after the concussion, during the examination. And other tests such as CT or MRI. CT is usually ordered um, when the patient um, is coming to uh, emergency. Uh, and MRI usually after uh, we see that the patient has um, persistent symptoms, we usually refer them for to have an MRI to rule out other coexisting things or if there is any um, uh, something more than a concussion. But again, we expect not to see anything on um, CT or MRI related to concussion. Uh, and um, there are uh, some works and researchers looking for biomarkers for concussion, but at the clinical level, uh, these two examine history and uh, um, Imaging tests, tests uh, they are uh, the main things that we are usually do. And concussion can be recognized by even non medical professionals in the community. Uh, persistent symptoms after the concussion injury to the brain can result in, again, physical, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral symptoms, which are persistent. Um, single or multiple concussion can cause persistent symptoms. Uh, but uh, when we have multiple concussions, um, um, the chance of having persistent symptoms uh, is higher. Uh, each, concussions, uh, each concussion lowers the threshold of getting another concussion uh, and also has a cumulative effect. Uh, so um, especially when the patient is in the recovery phase, it's very important uh, not to have another concussion and the brain is more vulnerable to get another concussion, even with minor blow. Uh, physical persistent symptoms including headaches, dizziness, vertigo, balance issues, tinnitus, vision problems, light and noise sensitivity, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, sexual problems, sleep problems. These symptoms again are not specific to concussion and they can they are common in healthy individuals and uh, they can be caused by, dif by different reasons. 
Cognitive symptoms after the concussion, mainly short-term memory problems, attention problems, concentration issues, and executive uh, dysfunction like uh, difficulty with planning, organizing, problem solving, reasoning, and speech problems, including uh, word finding difficulty um, or a difficulty with participating in conversations, difficulty with reading, writing, spelling, and comprehension. So uh, a wide variety of symptoms related to speech. Again, these symptoms are not specific to concussion. And emotional behavioral symptoms, very common symptom is irritability, anger, aggression, depression, and anxiety, um, personality changes, substance abuse, PTSD, post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, and loss of motivation, and uh, grieving. Uh, so uh, we have mood issues related directly to the concussion, even without any history of mood issues in patients before the concussion. Uh, changes in mood following the concussion is very important because uh, there are many emotions post-concussion from mild irritability to depression to suicidality. Uh, so uh, they should be addressed. There are very, very important to treat mood issues because uh, emotional difficulties can worsen other symptoms and can delay the recovery. Um, they can um, also uh, negatively affect um, uh, the social, um, uh, personal life, family life, and the social life. So treating mood issues it can impact behavior and can improve other symptoms, uh, other concussion symptoms. It's possible that factors other than concussion cause concussion type symptoms, for example, orthopedic injuries, neck injuries. Uh, for example, neck injury can cause headaches, uh, can worsen the pain. So it's very important, maybe a patient has a concussion and, and neck injury at the same time. So it's very important to rule out everything. And it's important to reassess uh, the medication. So some medications can worsen the symptoms of the concussion. Psychological issues, history of depression, anxiety before the concussion, any history of uh, um, diseases with pain like fibromyalgia, for example, uh, they can worsen the symptoms and they can cause uh, concussion type symptoms. And sleep uh, disorders, stress, these are the factors that can lead to concussion type symptoms. Post-concussion syndrome. The diagnosis uh, of post-concussion syndromes usually required uh, syndrome usually required uh, a head trauma, trouble with um, uh, cognitive problem, trouble with remembering or attention problems, and um, three or more symptoms of physical, cognitive, and emotional behavioral symptoms that last. Um, more than three months. So we need persistent symptoms and problem with social occupational functioning. Now there is some controversy about using post-concussion syndrome and um, it's, um, um, the trend is more to using post-concussion -con persistent symptoms because post-concussion syndrome symptoms are not unique to concussion and they may have overlap with other diagnoses that, um, for example, result from this traumatic experience or the pain can be related to other con um, conditions. And there can, the symptoms can be found in healthy individuals with no history of concussion. And the, um, the mood issues and depressive symptoms also uh, can affect them a lot. So that's why there are some controversy about use uh, around use of this term. Uh, so uh, persistent post-concussion symptoms, uh, they are very important and they need to be addressed because they are associated with poor quality of life. They are associated with an overwhelm over the health uh, care uh, system and they need a high uh, health care service. Uh, and also uh, they're associated with high levels of disability. Uh, very important to address all the symptoms after the concussions and they should be managed and treated. Um, especially the sleep problems, mood and pain. These three things, uh, they should be addressed. 
because they can affect other symptoms and they can affect um, the recovery phase. Uh, they can delay the recovery. For example, a poor sleep can cause cognitive problems, memory problems, and can um, the memory problems can be associated with um, more uh, mood issues and. Um, you can and and also for example deep sleep can be associated with increasing headaches for example, early morning headaches so we are uh, talking about it more in the next session uh, so that's why these three uh, should be treated and managed properly um, if um, a patient has persistent symptoms her symptoms or his symptoms should be reassessed and fit more physical examination should be done. Um, it's very important uh, to, um, to have a good history in order to, uh, to see what mental or social factors uh, the patient has in order um, that can affect the symptoms and can worsen them or uh, delay the recovery. Uh, it's very important to um, reassess again, uh, as I told uh, in the previous slides, um, uh, the medications and also the over-counter medications. Um, it's important to uh, check if the patient is uh, drinking alcohol or using um, other drugs, including marijuana. Uh, these are the things that can um, have some effect over the symptoms. Symptoms. Uh, and it's important to know that if these symptoms are right after the concussion, they are directly from the concussion or from other, fact, uh, other uh, factors, for example. If the past medical history of the patient is very important um, because uh, some symptoms are getting worse after the concussion, but the patient has, for example, mood issues and it's getting worse after the concussion, has headaches and getting uh, worse after the concussion. Uh, so uh, it's important to have a special assessment and sometimes um, uh, it's important to refer the pa um, uh, patients to um, uh, have some specific uh, symptom management and specialized assessment or treatment. Uh, so the approach is um, individualized for each patient. Uh, so the priority for primary health care providers uh, uh, is managing symptoms and also is encouraging patients to gradually return to their activity, but gradually return. It's important to gradually return to work, gradually return to school, and, and not impact sports. Um, but um, the thing is that we usually recommend uh, individuals or patients uh, not to um, go beyond their uh, threshold and not to push themselves because uh, uh, we don't like that they bring up their symptoms by doing um, more than their threshold physical and mental activities. And uh, those who receive education and treatment earlier during the course, um, during the period after the concussion, they are more likely to have fewer persistent symptoms later. After a single concussion, most patient, uh, most people make a full recovery and only 10 to 15 uh, percent of uh, people, they um, have a persistent symptoms. Um, and usually the first few weeks after the concussion, cognitive effects are very, uh, are the strongest in the first few weeks. And there is wide vari uh, variation in how people recover after the concussion. Um, some impairments can last longer than one to three months, even six months, a year, or even longer. We don't have any definite time to, re um, to say that this is a time that everyone should be recovered after the concussions. And as I said before, multiple concussions, of course, the recovery time um, is longer and they are more likely to have lasting symptoms. And uh, there are some evidence that um, that uh, the time to recover can vary. For example, it depends on the type of the injury and um, the mechanism of the injury, and also uh, the type of the concussion, of course. For example, the motor vehicle accidents, usually uh, it's more complicated because um, there are different factors uh, affecting the concussion. For example, the whole concussion, which is more complicated and the uh, legal things involved and uh, the 
PTSD of the whole uh, trauma. So these are the things that may affect the recovery. Um, but most workers return to work within three to six months after the concussion. And uh, usually sport concussions, uh, they most recover within days to a few weeks. So it's usually faster. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, I'm uh, going to go over to Dr. Rotan. Great. Uh, so there are also, in terms of recovery from concussion, there are, we continue to uh, investigate why certain people are more vulnerable to having uh, prolonged symptoms. And some of the medical factors that have been identified, um, and these come from the ONF guideline, uh, are things like having, as we've already mentioned, a, a history of a, a previous traumatic brain injury or history of other physical limitations. We know also previous neurological or psychiatric issues, uh, if there is the presence of a skull fracture, and early onset of pain, and in particular headache within 24 hours after the injury. Um, also, there are just confounding effects of other health-related issues. People may be on taking medications. They may have associated injuries. Uh, there may be emotional distress. Certainly anxiety uh, seems to make people more vulnerable. And also just having a high number of symptoms that are reported early on at the time uh, after the injury. And these can uh, be reflected on something like the River Meter post-concussion symptom questionnaire that your uh, physician might administer uh, when you see them. So in addition to medical factors, there are also contextual factors. So things like personal, psychosocial, environmental factors that can also affect uh, an individual's recovery rate. And as Dr. Tarazi mentioned, uh, we, we do note that injuries that are sustained in motor vehicle accidents or when there is uh, involvement in litigation, it really can complicate matters and people tend to take longer to recover. Also, individuals that don't return to work or where there's a really significant delay in doing so um, tend to be more vulnerable. Also, high level of symptom reporting is associated with mood symptoms and just self-aware awareness of deficits. We also, it's also been noted that being a student, um, being older, uh, lacking in social support uh, are other factors that can impact. Also being female. So females tend to have a more protracted recovery than males. And then just life stressors at the time of the injury. Uh, and then um, just the last one, if, if someone is returning to a contact uh, sporting activity. We always like to say a little bit just about concussion in the media, just because it is in the media a lot, and it really is important to uh, point out that, that certainly there is some sensationalizing uh, going on. And so it is really important not to believe everything that you read and really to evaluate uh, the evidence in terms of what is being reported. There really is still a lot that we don't know about concussion and, and a lot of research that continues. In terms of symptom management, I think it's really important to say this, that there really is no magic bullet. Uh, there's no magic pill. There's nothing that we have at this point that can um, cure a concussion. What we have right now is the ONF guideline. And what we wanna do with that is to address the symptoms. And as we've been talking about, you can get a whole range of different symptoms, physical, cognitive, behavioral, um, and all of these need to be treated on a symptom by symptom basis. Individuals that have had multiple concussions, it may require more intensive management. In terms of the management that's generally recommended right now, in terms of immediate management, uh, it, certainly individuals are, are recommended to engage in some rest, cognitive rest, the so limiting activities that require attention, concentration, limiting their time on screens, uh, and physically resting. However, not for an extended period of time. So it used to be the case that individuals were told to stay in a dark room for an extended period of time. We now know that that is not helpful and in fact can be harmful uh, when people are doing that. So we really wanna see people, uh, as you can see below in terms of longer term management as well, is that people are starting to gradually return to their activities such as school, work and recreation and really doing what you can. 
and increasing your time and effort and activities just as you're able to do without significantly worsening symptoms. In terms of uh, symptom management, so for individuals that are struggling with, with long-standing symptoms, it's often the case that multiple healthcare providers may be necessary to manage those symptoms. And each discipline has specific and defined roles. And the type of therapists that are needed is really gonna depend, uh, it's gonna vary uh, depending on the individual and their types of symptoms. Um, and this is a, a relatively long list of the different types of practitioners that, that someone might see, an occupational therapist, physiotherapist, speech therapist, um, chiropractor, uh, psychologist, um, psychiatrist, physician, different types of physicians, uh, and so forth. But again, uh, we wouldn't expect that someone would be seeing all of these people, depending on the symptoms, you would have the appropriate practitioner. Now, in terms of management, as Dr. Tarasi said, we're going to talk more in November about specific management strategies and management tools. Um, but we thought we would just bring up a couple of tools that we often recommend to individuals. And while these don't, uh, they're not specific treatments for concussion per se, they are tools that can be helpful with many of the symptoms that, that occur um, following a concussion, concussion, crossing different domains. So not only emotional, but also the physical um, and even the cognitive. So one of these is, is mindfulness meditation. And this has been bigger in the media as well. And you may have heard of this, but the idea with uh, mindfulness meditation, it, it's been defined as really just paying attention in a particular way on purpose in the present moment without judging yourself. Um, you know, most of the time we spend in our head, we're, we're worrying about something that's just happened. We're worrying about something that's going to happen. And it's, it's not often that we, we're just simply in the moment and focusing on our breath or on a sound. Um, and this is what mindfulness meditation uh, can do. And we know that individuals that meditate on a regular basis actually show changes positive changes in their, their brain and behavior. And the literature suggests that it can really help us to reduce worry and stress. It's been, there's some studies to suggest that it can help us improve our focus and our attention. Um, also help with things like sleep, blood pressure, mood issues, as well as physical pain. So you can see how something like this could potentially re be really uh, beneficial uh, for someone that's struggling with a variety of post-concussive symptoms. The second tool is cognitive behavioral therapy. And this is a type of psychotherapy. Again, we're gonna talk more about these in November, but just to introduce it, it is really a type of talk therapy that uh, focuses a lot on our thoughts, on our thoughts about ourselves, about other people, about the world. Um, and the idea again is to help uh, with, with behavior change or mood disorders such as depression. It was originally developed to treat depression, but it has since been expanded uh, to work with all kinds of uh, difficulties. And basically in terms of how, how it works or the idea behind it is that our understanding uh, or perception of event of an event can really affect how we feel emotionally, how we act behaviorally, as well as even physiological responses in our body. And so CBT teaches us to find dysfunctional thoughts, which we all certainly have from time to time, that may contribute to our negative moods. And by changing these thoughts, we can in turn improve our mood and how we respond when, when we're faced with difficult situations. And in terms of the thoughts, this in figure 2.1, you can see uh, this is basically sort of the, the idea behind all of this is that there is this interaction between our thoughts, between our feelings, our moods, our behaviors, as well as our physical reactions. And if we're thinking in, if we're making errors in our thinking, which again, probably all of us can identify with. So things like all or none thinking, nothing thinking. So thinking in black and white, um, you know, either I do 100% perfect or I'm a complete failure uh, or overgeneralizing. So seeing one negative event as predictive of, of what your whole day or whole week is going to be like. Uh, so what CBT does is to help us to start to identify those and challenge those. And you can basically get a sort of a positive spin-off reaction in terms of how we're feeling, 
how we behave and what's happening in our body. This is a tool uh, that is used in cognitive behavioral therapy called a, a thought record. And this just gives you, this will just give you a very quick overview of, of what uh, we encourage people to do. So you're writing down, you, you, you would do this when you notice sort of a negative trend in your mood. So this, this individual, it's Monday night, it's two in the morning and, and they, they can't get to sleep. They wake up and, and the next column is mood. So they're feeling frustrated, they're feeling anxious, and then they're asked to rate how frustrated or anxious they're feeling. The next step is identifying what we call automatic thoughts. So these are the thoughts that, again, that we all have that we sometimes don't even recognize uh, are there. So I'm never gonna fall asleep. If I don't get to sleep now, tomorrow's gonna be terrible. I'm never gonna get better. And then what we ask people to do is to identify the thought that is really what we call the hot thought or the thought that's contributing to those negative emotions. We then work with the client to try and come up with evidence either for, so, you know, this is the fourth night, this has happened this week, this is just one of, you know, umpteen uh, post-concussive symptoms that I'm having and I have to deal with. We then ask the individual, you know, is there anything that would argue against that hot thought? And the individual is saying, well, some of my symptoms have disappeared, but, and, and actually most have gotten better. I had more difficulty sleeping last week and, oh yeah, I, I'm kind of nervous about this upcoming appointment. So then individuals are asked if, if they can to come up with an alternative thought. Uh, and that would be something that's a bit more balanced. It may not be the complete opposite, but in this case, they're saying, well, even though I still have some symptoms, things are getting better overall. And I do have trouble sleeping, but there may be other factors contributing beside the concussion. And they're also asked to rate how much they believe the alternate thought, because obviously if you don't believe it, it's not gonna be helpful. So this is where it can be helpful to be working on this with someone. And then finally, uh, the, individuals, it, the individual is asked to sort of re-rate their uh, negative emotions. And while they may not, you know, it's, again, this isn't like a magic bullet, uh, but it can be helpful in reducing some of those negative, um, negative feelings. And as I said, we'll talk more about CBT and mindfulness uh, in November. Uh, just a short word on alternative therapies. We often have individuals asking us about things like hyperbaric oxygen or herbal remedies, uh, nutritional supplements, concussion-proof helmets. And so it really is important to know that there are a lot of things being put out there, uh, basically be, being said to be a magic bullet. And, and so it is important to know that that, that just doesn't exist. And uh, there's a lot of things that are out there where we don't have definitive evidence uh, to suggest that they are uh, effective uh, treatments for concussion. In terms of concussion prevention, a great website to check out is parachute.ca. Um, and you can find all kinds of resources on there. But just generally speaking, when you've had a concussion, you wanna avoid risky activities, especially while you're still symptomatic, uh, you know, not returning until till play if it's, if it's sport, um, until cleared to do so, avoiding alcohol and recreational drugs, and just, you know, common sense things like wearing a helmet, wearing a seat belt, you know, uh, while a helmet can't prevent concussions per se, it certainly can prevent individuals from sustaining more severe traumatic brain injury. So, so always important to do. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Tatter now. Good evening, everybody. I'm very pleased to um, accompany Leslie and Apame in this patient um, education and support session. Um, we've been doing this for many years, since 2014, and um, we've had very good um, support uh, from Layuna for this, and we appreciate uh, everyone's um, efforts in attending and trying to gain some further understanding of their concussions. Uh, we do think it's uh, very important for people to try to understand what the mechanism is of uh, some of their symptoms and how to deal with it. And we're very open to uh, answering questions because, in fact, uh, our group uh, got started um, at the Canadian Concussion Center about 
uh, 10 years ago. And uh, we, we actually feel we've been very busy answering questions, questions that we had about concussion that we tried to answer and questions that uh, patients have about it. And we understand that there's still a lot of mystery and that you may not get the same answer depending on the, the so-called uh, expert, quote unquote, that you ask the question to. So we're all trying to do our best to increase understanding of concussion through research and also through um, helping patients uh, recover from their uh, concussions. So let's start with the issue of screen time. Uh, this is a very important uh, symptom, in fact, that people have. And we, we give it a fancy name called uh, computer uh, intolerance or screen intolerance, meaning that when you're in front of a computer screen or a movie screen or a TV screen, that you can be aggravated by it, that it can make your headache worse, that it can increase your feeling of nausea or increase your feeling of dizziness. Um, so why is that? And we spend quite a bit of time trying to figure this out. And there are um, a number of factors. The first is brightness, that just like people who have migraine headaches, are aggravated by a bright sunny day or a bright light overhead. The same is true with many people who have concussions that too much light is aggravating. And it turns out that computer screens and TV screens and movie screens, even cell phone screens, give off a fair amount of light. And that's why an e-reader, for example, is often um, easier to handle than, than a cell phone because the e-reader um, depends primarily on just the surrounding light around you. It's not got a very strong backlight, whereas a computer has a very strong backlight. But the good news is that with a computer or cell phone, you can actually turn down the intensity of the light. So that's number one, brightness. Number two is color. And it turns out that color of various types is more aggravating than other colors. So orangey brown is less aggravating, for example, than blue. So the corner of the screen that you're looking at now, that blue color, turns out to be one of the most aggravating for people who have concussion. And we know the exact wavelength of the color that is most bothersome and turns out to be this type of blue. Whereas for some strange reason, the way our eyes are built and the way the brain is built, orangey brown colors are less aggravating. So you can change the color of your screen. If you have um, a PC, there is a program um, that you can get um, that is um, available for downloading. It's called F.Lux, F.Lux. You can download the program free. It'll change the color of your screen. You can do the same thing with a cell phone. Um, Apple uses one format. I think it's called nighttime and other uh, cell phones use other formats, but you can definitely change the color to a less aggravating color. And the third factor with, uh, with screens is the flicker. Flicker is much harder to deal with. Uh, science really hasn't solved this problem in a in an inexpensive way. You can buy a computer screen that does not flicker or flickers very minimally. The average computer screen flickers, that is changes the scene that you're looking at about 60 Hertz. 
that means 60 times a second, the screen actually changes. And that is not well tolerated after concussion. The brain can't do the fusion of the images that it can normally do. So you can deal with that by buying a screen that doesn't flicker. Uh, it turns a computer into like an e-reader or into like a newspaper, which obviously doesn't flicker. But it's very expensive and some people just don't like the screen because it tends to be smaller than a regular computer screen. But it has gotten some people back to work uh, earlier. So yes, there are things you can do to improve your screen time. We um, also recommend that it be in a reasonable dose. And uh, Oppame has mentioned the concept of threshold. And that's, that's probably a good opportunity to emphasize that now. Um, so you can uh, picture yourself turning the TV on and being able to handle what you are uh, witnessing for, for five or 10 minutes, and then you start to be aggravated by it. You get a headache, you, some people get nauseated or dizzy, and that's the time to turn it off. In other words, it isn't worth the, um, um, the effort to increase your symptoms by persisting. So please don't um, persist and try to uh, work over and above your threshold. So this, con this concept of threshold applies to things other than screen time. So the issue of memory loss is an important aspect of concussion. And it doesn't happen to everybody, but it is a, it is a factor when the symptoms of concussion persist, that memory loss is often a factor. And it can take the form of recent memory difficulty. So for example, where did I leave my keys? Uh, approaching a parking lot and say, oh, I can't remember where I parked the car. And um, having people say, you know, you already told me that, Dad. Don't keep repeating yourself. And yet the person doesn't remember having said it the first time. So memory loss often involves recent memory. It's a common symptom. Um, there isn't a great deal that we can recommend in terms of treatment. The good news, however, is that generally over time, uh, memory improves. Uh, if it doesn't, then we certainly want to carefully document it. And we do have some strategies that can help people, you know, simple things like um, writing, writing things down, leaving uh, sticky notes for yourself where you're going to uh, not miss them. But um, it, it, is, it is a symptom that usually uh, improves uh, over time. The, um, the problem that um, the viewer, whoever you are, is um, commenting on here is an important one that we um, have not um, <clears throat> been able to overcome. And that is the issue of uh, too many concussions uh, leading ultimately to uh, actual neurodegeneration, in other words, actual damage to the brain. Fortunately, this is a rather rare event. You, it takes quite a few concussions to produce significant 
damage to the brain to the extent that dementia comes along. When it is severe, we call it chronic traumatic encephalopathy or uh, TBI. And uh, it's, it's quite rare, fortunately. In certain um, activities like football, the incidence has been um, higher than in other activities. For example, hockey doesn't seem to cause as much uh, problems with long-term memory loss and dementia as football. And we um, are still researching this uh, heavily. Um, but as I, as I mentioned, the um, incidence of it is still uh, quite low. So the, the issue of how long you can um, take to recover uh, from concussion is demonstrated here. In other words, this person, unfortunately, is continuing to have um, symptoms for many years after concussion. And in, in our clinic, we do focus on those who don't get better quickly. Um, there are a number of clinics across the country now that have expertise in managing uh, what we call prolonged symptoms, in other words, those that last years. And the general trend is that we can still uh, produce some recovery even after many years. So we try to stay positive about the effects of treatment and the ability of the brain to recover we know that even the adult brain and the older brain have some recovery potential. Uh, young people do tend to recover faster uh, and more completely than older people, but even older people can, <clears throat> excuse me, obtain some recovery uh, even years later. This is a great question about exercise. Uh, because a lot of people aren't informed about what type of exercise they should do after a concussion. Gra we like people to uh, gradually introduce exercise. In the old days, we used to say, well, you better rest for a few weeks. But now we only say rest for a few hours and then get busy uh, exercising. The best types of exercises are those that don't jiggle the brain. It's better to avoid impact. And even something like jogging, uh, this person likes to jog, for example. And so jogging often comes up in, in co conversation with uh, patients suffering from concussion. They say, well, I went jogging. And I felt worse afterwards. So why did you tell me to exercise? Well, the issue is we wouldn't have recommended jogging. We would have recommended, for example, fast walking, where there is no impact to the brain. The problem with jogging is that the brain moves uh, within the skull uh, while you're jogging. So every time your foot comes down onto the pavement, uh, the brain moves within the skull. Whereas when you're walking quickly uh, along the same firm pavement, there is no movement of the brain within the skull. So try to avoid any impact type of activity. For example, basketball, hockey, would not be activities to perform early after a concussion because that's going to move the brain around. And every time the brain moves around, symptoms can be produced. So uh, fast walking is terrific. Swimming is terrific. 
but not the crawl. Because when you turn your head to breathe, the brain is moving within the skull. So do the side stroke or do the back stroke because there is no movement of the brain within the skull. Uh, other very good activities are the elliptical trainer or a stationary bicycle. And don't forget when you're exercising, do it in a risk-free environment. The importance of not getting another concussion until you fully recovered from the last concussion needs to be emphasized. When, when, so when you go out uh, exercising, don't ride a mountain bike down a bumpy trail. Uh, don't get knocked off your bike in heavy traffic and get another concussion. So you have to exercise caution. So, um, the, and then again, here it's the same issue of the question of threshold that we've already talked about. So you, sh you can continue to do exercise as long as it doesn't bring on symptoms. So we always like to start gradually because we want to stress, again, the fact of threshold, but threshold may take time to develop. So for example, some people have what we call a latent period between the time they do an activity and the time symptoms arise from that activity. It can be as long as 24 hours. So we often tell people, watch what happens after you introduce a new exercise, wait at least 24 hours before you repeat it, uh, because it may take a few hours for that exercise to show up as causing an increase in your symptoms. So we call that a latent period. And um, the latent period can be as long as 24 hours, but usually it's only uh, 10 or 12 hours. Um, and some people have no latent period. So as soon as they go over the threshold, they know because the symptoms come on quickly. So that's easier to deal with uh, than those who have this problem of latency. So it, the other aspect of this is you don't have to totally stop when. Um, you get symptoms that you've gone over your threshold. You may just rest for a few minutes or slow down the pace of your walking till the headache goes away. So you can sort of deal with your threshold uh, on an individual basis like that, depending on how, uh, how much exacerbation or worsening of symptoms an activity has caused. So this is an important uh, issue as well, and that is the amount of force that is necessary to cause a setback. Sometimes a setback is actually a full-blown concussion. So somebody, let's say, who fell downstairs, got a concussion, and then bumped their head on a sofa as this person did. Um, so it wasn't a hard stairway, but it was a soft sofa. And it wasn't as big a fall, for example, as someone who fell downstairs and you just banged it on the sofa. But that may be enough to cause a setback. The brain is very vulnerable to another blow for a period of time after the concussion has happened. So it's very important not to bang your head. Simple things like bending over to pick up a coin 
uh, when somebody else left the drawer open or the cupboard door was was open and you bang your head on the door or, you know all kinds of things that normally wouldn't matter do matter when you're recovering from a concussion so try not to produce a setback by bumping your head because it may take time for you to get back to your regular baseline concussions are cumulative there's no doubt about it now it may not be uh, another full-blown concussion as we've said it could just be a temporary setback but the important issue is prevention So this question is really a good one because it is something that people tell us about when they have had their concussions for a while, and especially in activities where other people get involved. And by other people, I mean, um, especially motor vehicle crashes or injuries at work, where there may be a range of other people that you're having to deal with, you know, your supervisor at work, um, your um, insurance company uh, person who you depend on for uh, paying for the therapy that you're undergoing, uh, or if you've had to hire a lawyer. We actually do encourage people to hire a uh, lawyers if they are having trouble navigating through the system, especially if it's a motor vehicle crash. So um, I think it's best to listen to your doctor uh, or your nurse practitioner, whoever is the healthcare professional who's helping you deal with your concussion i think it's better to listen to advice from your healthcare professional rather than from your lawyer or insurance company in terms of choosing the right therapist you have to actually hit it off with the therapist especially if it's for emotional difficulties that Dr. Terezi described, and Dr. Rotan is expert in. So I think advice from the expert is more important than advice from your lawyer or insurance company as to choosing the right therapist for you. The issue of driving is an important one, especially if you have dizziness. So for example, this person is still feeling slightly dizzy, and dizzy can be a feeling of imbalance or can actually be a feeling of movement, either the environment moving or feeling that your head is moving in space. And that can sometimes be precipitated by head motion. So for example, you bend over to pick up something, or if you look to your right or to your left to see an oncoming car or a pedestrian. So when you're driving, your head is moving a fair amount. Now it's good, of course, to use the mirrors, the side view mirrors, the rear view mirrors to, to make sure you're covering everything. But you have to move your head to a certain extent. Now, if moving your head precipitates dizziness and you get that while you're driving, it's clear you shouldn't be driving. So be sure to talk this over you know, with your healthcare professional, whether it is safe for you to drive. And there are some times when we recommend people should go have a couple of sessions with a driving instructor to make sure that they are fit for driving in terms of 
uh, recovery from concussion. Return to work is a, um, an issue that uh, concussed people deal with uh, all the time, and it's a very important issue. From the therapy point of view, we do feel that work is part of the treatment. The brain does like to be busy. So that is one of the reasons why most people do enjoy their work um, and so we do want to get people back to work as quickly as possible we do regard work not as the enemy but as part of the therapy and we're very keen to employ a range of experts in assisting people to get back to work especially occupational therapists and physical therapists who have expertise in plotting the, the type of work that you can return to and see, to see if that is compatible with, with your symptoms. You don't have to be fully recovered before you return to most jobs. Some jobs, yes, for example, if you're a hydro worker having to climb telephone poles, uh, the chance of re-injury, of, uh, of falling off is so great that uh, you do have to be fully recovered in order to return to some positions that require that degree of performance. For example, like a football player or a hockey player, so you shouldn't really return to to those activities until you're fully recovered because of the risk of re-injury. But for example, someone who's returning to a desk job, we recommend early return. We have to be careful about computer intolerance and screen intolerance, of course, um, because many desk jobs nowadays require several hours in front of a computer every day so that often is a rate limiting step but in general we regard work as a friend of concussion and we like people to return to work on a graduated basis as quickly as possible and the interplay between a therapist or your healthcare professional and your work environment is very helpful in order to try to ease your way uh, back to work on a graduated basis. And by graduated, we mean what is tolerated, what doesn't upset the apple cart, what doesn't um, reach your threshold for tolerance and result in dizziness and headache and nausea and sleeplessness, et cetera. the time it takes to recover is the issue with this question and um it doesn't really there isn't really a definite period in which everybody recovers beyond that first month or so most people 75 percent let's say recover within a month but the, those who don't, recovery can be extended for a long period of time. And two years in our experience is not, um, it does not mean you'll never recover. We have many people who continue to recover five years, six years, eight years after a concussion if they are treated with um, expert care, individualized, multidisciplinary care, then some further recovery can be expected even years later. So don't give up hope of continuing to recover. I don't work at the Hull 
LS Concussion Clinic, but I do know that in general, there's been a slowdown in the appointments and the responsiveness uh, of uh, healthcare professionals to people who are having problems with concussion. But the good news is that it is now picked up again, especially um, the fact that many practitioners have learned how to do virtual care, uh, even by telephone or by um, video um, accompaniment, like through the Ontario Telehealth Network which is what I use, um, and it's, it actually works out well with most concussion recovery people. Uh, the uh, virtual visit can be very effective, and in fact, it's shown us that people, you know, in any part of the country, remote parts of the country where healthcare professionals are not plentiful, the, those people can still be helped with concussion recovery through virtual visits. And I think that actually will outlive the COVID-19 pandemic that the healthcare professionals have learned to use uh, uh, virtual visits and much to the benefit of uh, the concussion folks. Well, thank you everyone for attending. We really hope that you found this education session helpful. And we would be more than uh, happy to, as Dr. Tatter had said, to uh, receive any feedback, any suggestions, anything that you would like to see or have answered. Uh, you can go to the, uh, the link that is noted on the screen and complete the survey there. Uh, just so that you're also aware, on the Canadian Concussion Center website, we have uh, an archived version of a full uh, education and support workshop. Uh, that is under the patient support tab on the website. And just in terms of a few additional resources that you might wanna check out. So we had very quickly covered uh, mindfulness and cognitive behavioral therapy, and there are a lot of apps out there that you can just try out on your own, many of which have free content. So for mindfulness, Calm, Insight Timer, Headspace, Stop, Breathe and Think are all uh, highly rated apps. Uh, some, they often will have some degree of free content and some paid, but Insight Timer in particular has thousands of, of meditations that you can try out, some as short as just one minute long. Uh, that you can put onto your uh, smartphone. And then for cognitive behavioral therapy as well, uh, you, you saw an example of a thought record. They actually, there are apps that you can put right onto your phone where you would actually enter things like this into your phone, apps such as Thought Diary, Mood Path, or Mood Fit. And these are just examples. We, we aren't endorsing any of these, but they're just uh, possibilities that you might wanna try out. And finally, we just want to remind you that we are going to have a follow-up to today's session with more specific treatment uh, suggestions, and that will be posted on the website on November the 24th. And in advance of that session, if you have additional questions that you would like answered, you can either submit them at the link or use the QR code that is on the screen, and you can submit them there and they will be included in our, in our talk in November. Thanks again.